Hello, this is the Coast Guard Foundation's second annual Heroes of the Coast Guard. I'm Amy Scott, and I have the privilege of leading you through a behind-the-scenes look at the lives of our United States Coast Guard members. A life that's sometimes thrilling, sometimes dangerous, sometimes fun, but always heroic. You'll see rescues in action. We'll show you what a day in the life of a Coastie is, how they support each other, and we'll speak to the Coast Guard Foundation's president, Susan Ludwig, about all the great ways the Coast Guard Foundation helps the Coast Guard members and their families. We'll introduce you to the first ever woman service chief of any of the armed forces, guess which one, and we'll even meet a few Coast Guard canine heroes. First up, though, is the rescue story featuring all kinds of bravery. The victims were brave, well, scared and brave, and the Coasties were, of course, brave. And when they all come together after the fact, well, it's pretty moving. We went out just to enjoy the day, catch fish. These were recreational fishermen uh, that were out there on a family fishing trip off of Cedar Key where they launched their boat. We limited out <laughs> and we were done. We were just having fun, throwing bait out, enjoying the day. These storms came in so quickly. They built up so quickly and nobody knew they were coming exactly. You're looking at waves going up and it's, it's starting to get scary. Um, we already had on life vests by then and just more water's coming over the boat. We started radioing Coast Guard because we were about to go down. Mayday, mayday, mayday. And they had some interaction between themselves and the boat. They didn't get an exact position. They lost communication shortly after, but the watch standard got just enough information to know that they were in distress and also to tell them to stay with their boat no matter what they did. And it's flipped and now everybody's in the water. We're all trying to scramble to get back to the boat. And um, we're trying to figure out bearings and a wave come over your head. <laughs> and you just, you're trying to grab on to anything and everything you can on a slick boat. And it's just like, hold on now. And you're just getting battered by waves coming over your head. My life vests keep coming off. They were in the water for quite a while. Uh, the H-60 and the C-130 launched from Air Station Clearwater in the afternoon, searched overnight. I mean, like, okay, <laughs> uh, who are these guys at? We're screaming, you know, <laughs> doing everything cold, soaked, running out of faith at this point, you know, uh, we've been praying. They have to navigate around thunderstorms to get into the search area. So it was a good 12, 13 hours of searching overnight with no results because of difficult search conditions. So we were launched in the morning. We were called in early. We were told that the other crews had been searching overnight and they needed relief on scene immediately. And we came on for what's called a first light search. What we got from sector was our first assigned search. We searched there for about an hour. We didn't find anything. Sun came up. Waves started getting a little worse again, but uh, after about two hours, I thought I heard like this little buzz noise. And I'm like, no, you know, my mind's been playing tricks on me all night long. It's nothing. We started our own search nearby. We found something almost immediately, some white floating debris. And then after that, a full cooler full of fish. Once we found that full cooler full of fish, we knew that they were somewhere close by. This had to be our boat. And you see this little speck. And it's, and it's a, <laughs> a big helicopter looking for you. Shortly after, we found four people sitting on top of an overturned boat. And we knew that was it. And we just started doing circles around them. Um, they didn't have any communications with us, obviously, so um, they just lowered me down. I just reassured them that they were safe. I just made sure that we had everybody accounted for, nobody was missing and I asked them about any injuries, and we hoisted the older man first because they told me he couldn't swim, so I wanted to make sure he was safe first. The rescue swimmer would recover one person, swim them over to the basket, we would hoist them up. Once they were actually safely in the cabin and strapped in a seat, we would get the next one until we had all four on board. This case uh, was a feel-good case for us. We get a lot of cases, and they don't always end well. This was one of those where you had a very thankful family coming up, 
and they had spent a rough night out there on the water and we can only imagine how rough it was. And it just felt good to see their faces and uh, their expressions when they came up and they were thankful for being there. We found them and you know, it was my first rescue. So I like got this big surge of adrenaline and I was like, wow, this is, this is cool. It's an honor to finally shake your hand again. Yeah, it's an honor to <laughs> shake your hand too, man. That's it's to be great to see you so again. much, man. It's Truly, great to see from you again. all of our families, thank you. Oh, I can't man. even think of a word. To thank you for even choosing this career. <laughs> like, whatever in your childhood made you say, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, I thank that moment. Because without you guys, I wouldn't be here today in, in honesty. I'm lucky to be alive. Without Coast Guard, I wouldn't be here today my family from Florida to South Carolina, they, they be missing a family member, a, a son, cousin, brother, it doesn't matter. Thank you to the Coast Guard. It's, it's truly a gift. Thank you. You know, being a Coast Guard member can be very dangerous, whether they are swimming to boaters caught up in a storm, chasing illegal drug runners, or saving someone swept up in a disaster like a flood or a hurricane. They signed up for it and they love it, but who takes care of the Coasties when their own lives and families are impacted by a disaster? Well, I'll tell you who, it's the Coast Guard Foundation. Earlier, I was fortunate enough to sit down with Susan Ludwig, the president of the Coast Guard Foundation, to talk about it. Susan, it's so nice to see you again. It's nice to see you too, Amy. You know, I just found out that the Coast Guard Foundation has been in operation for over 50 years. It was like started in 1969. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking for people who are just tuning in or maybe don't know that much about the foundation, what would you like them to know? Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. It's really such an honor to be associated with this service. The men, women, and children of the Coast Guard are committed to making this world a better place. And in response, the Coast Guard Foundation tackles the toughest challenges facing our heroes. We strengthen the Coast Guard communities by standing with the members where and when they need us the most. We provide scholarships for Coast Guard dependents. Mm -hmm. We provide education grants to both the Coast Guard members and their spouses. Remember, they're moving every three years as well. Uh, and in tragedy assistance, it's supporting the Coast Guard families who are facing some very difficult times. Mm -hmm. With hurricane assistance, it is our emergency assistance program that helps them as their own homes are being impacted. And we also prioritize health and wellness so that our members can remain ready for their assignments and maintain their own physical and mental well-being. Wow, that's all good stuff. So what do you think the next 50 years are going to look like for the foundation? Well, I'm confident, Amy, that as long as there's a United States Coast Guard, there will be a Coast Guard Foundation. We do have our core areas of support in education, relief, and morale. And we work very closely with Coast Guard leadership to uncover and identify emerging needs that they might have. Like what kind of emerging needs? One example is our current emphasis on family resiliency. You know, times are tough, mm -hmm. but so are our Coast Guard members and their families. We plan to broaden our support over the next 50 years to include more Coast Guard members and to deepen the level of financial commitment to each of those members. Uh, but we're confident uh, because of the last 50 years, as you mentioned, we have created a strong base in which to grow. We'll hear more about the Coast Guard Foundation's great work from Susan a little later. You know, I know Susan and her work, and you couldn't find a more devoted or capable person to run the foundation. And while we're on the topic of strong women, I'm about to introduce you to another strong woman. In 2022, a new role model assumed command of the United States Coast Guard. Today, we witness a tradition long standing in the United States Coast Guard. Change of command. So I will now read my orders from Commander Personnel Services Command to Admiral Carl Schultz. Upon relief of command, attach a report to retirement for the future. Thank you. With those words, Admiral Carl Schultz retired from 39 years of service and history was about to be made. It's now my privilege to introduce the 27th Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, I'm Melinda Fagan. Admiral Fagan, the first woman in American history to lead a military service. As a teenager, Fagan knew that she wanted to attend the Coast Guard Academy. 
After graduation, she was off to serve on all seven continents, Command Sector New York, become commander of 1st Coast Guard District, Coast Guard Defense Force West, and Vice Commandant. She's also the proud mother of a Coast Guard Lieutenant. I can't imagine a better mom, a better leader, a better person to serve for, and I'm so honored to follow in your footsteps. An inspiration not only to her daughter, but to all women and to everyone who serves under her. Admiral Fagan is a confident leader of the U.S. Coast Guard. Together, we will rise to the challenge of a changing world. Tomorrow looks different, and so will we. So women were first admitted to the Coast Guard Academy back in 1976, and now we've got a woman as commandant. Pretty awesome. You know, the Coast Guard Foundation really steps up for our service members in so many ways, one of which is through its scholarship program. And here's some proof of that success. Hello, my name is Tywan Lucas, and I am a Coast Guard Foundation scholarship recipient attending Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, I would just like to thank everyone and anyone on the Coast Guard Foundation Committee for giving me this opportunity to continue my, um, my educational journey. The scholarship means a lot to me and my family, so I would just like to thank you, thank everyone, thank anyone behind all of this, all of everyone in this whole organization. I would just like to say thank you for giving me this opportunity. Go Coast Guard. Coming up, have you ever wondered what it's like being in the Coast Guard? We'll talk to the team that protects the most restricted airspace in our country. And don't forget the dogs of the Coast Guard. Heroes of the Coast Guard is brought to you in part by our anchor sponsor, Chenier Energy. <laughs> To heroes of the Coast Guard. You know, being a Coast Guard member can mean a lot of things. Sure, some are pilots, some captain boats, some work behind the action. Some are seasoned military members, and some are young and just starting out their careers. Lots of differences, but you know what they have in common? They're all ready, willing, and able to save lives, and they are all dedicated to serve our country. Being at a small boat station, especially here in New Orleans, every day is different. Whether it is a search and rescue case an hour and a half away, or we are going to do a cruise ship escort. And then some days we fill those with training, making sure all of our members have the highest qualifications they're required to have. We are working out, making sure we're physically capable of responding to calls. And we're also a family when we're on duty. My name is Machinery Technician Third Class Ben Miller. Fireman Robert Morgan. This is Oscar. What's your day like? How does it start and what do you do? Depends on the day. It's either maintenance or training. Uh, a lot of days we do both. We go down to the boats and we do a boat check to make sure all the equipment's there, that it's running properly. Make sure that everything here electronically is working okay and accurate. Down here I'm checking our oil, our flue levels. One of our main evolutions is practicing man overboards in case someone falls off. But every day we do a four-hour patrol, minimum. It varies what time, sometimes it's the middle of the night, sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the afternoon. Sometimes we'll be doing recreational boater safety boardings to just inform the public. Other times we'll be doing counter drug and migrant interdiction. In facilities here, we do anything from electrical work to um, damage control, which can include plumbing, carpentry, uh, welding. Ace Navigation is the stoplights. They are the road signs of, of the ocean. 
of the inland waterways. And uh, so we, we go out there, we make sure the lights are blinking, we make sure day boards are, are maintained so they're nice and bright and uh, mariners can see them at night. I used to work as a mechanic on the helicopters when I was enlisted. Got to run the hoist, you know, pick people up out of the water. Um, eventually I went to officer candidate school and I got to flight school and became a pilot. And now I fly the helicopter in the front seat. Right now I'm the officer today, so I'm a direct representative of our commanding officer. Roger that. Hit the star alarm and pipe primer. Roger. With my information, I, I oversee like the basic operations of boat movements. Now primary boat crew make preps to get underway for vehicle in the water. Turn it up the chain of command and I give him my recommendations and then it just goes all the way up to him. Some of the more junior personnel who uh, aren't married, live on, on base in barracks. Think of it as like a, like a firehouse, right? You, you have guys that are living there with each other. They're grilling, they're cooking, so we, we eat here, we live here um, in our temporary duty rooms. You're here, you are here 24 hours a day. You're ready to go at any moment's notice. Always scares you when the alarm goes off, that's for sure. <laughs> So when the alarm goes off, you have somebody who's qualified to do everything that's going on. So while someone took the call over Channel 16, they're making correspondence with Sector Miami, getting things figured out. So you also have an engineer who's going down to start the boat. You've got someone who's opening the armory, getting all the guns ready, things like that. So I'd say everyone here flows together pretty nicely. So we move quickly and we get underway pretty fast. Why did you join the Coast Guard? I got in the Coast Guard to get out there and help people and save people. I, I was prior Air Force before, so I did five years enlisted, and I wanted to, always wanted to become an officer, and the Coast Guard provided me that opportunity. We train for something we do every day. Save your lives. Woo! It's easy to see why young people join the Coast Guard. The excitement, the community, the opportunity to see the world and give back. Coast Guard members are motivated to serve, and to do that, they must maintain their health and wellness. In fact, did you know that staying fit and in shape is actually a requirement for all Coast Guard duty assignments? To help them in this area, the Coast Guard Foundation comes in to provide essential support. Susan, can you tell me, what does the Coast Guard Foundation do to help support the service's uh, morale and wellness, and why is that important? Prioritizing the morale, health, and wellness of our Coast Guard members is crucial so they can remain always ready for their assignments and maintain their own physical and mental well-being while serving at sea or at extended duty stands. Uh, while the Coast Guard budget provides resources for some gym equipment, there remains a gap and we step in to fill that gap with things like exercise equipment and outdoor rec pieces both at Coast Guard stations and aboard Coast Guard cutters. Wow. So that's great for the Coast Guard service members, but what about morale for the families of the Coast Guard members? We have, Amy, created recreational spaces at their Coast Guard locations so that these families can gather together and really build a community for themselves. That's nice. We're learning so much about how important managing stress is. Being active is one way, so is taking the family out for a nice day off. The foundation partnered with the Armed Services YMCA San Diego so families could spend quality time together doing something just a little different. Horse of the Sun Ranch is in the uh, Cleveland National Forest about 45 minutes east of San Diego proper. Uh, family day. Today is a family day for the United States Coast Guard. Uh, military families have um, constant moves. They, the kids change schools a lot. It's hard for kids and families to make friends, to bond in our world. And do at the same time. And this is a good way for them you know, people with a common background to come together and enjoy each other's company. I have a horse and it's just like that one. You do? Oh my, for... I forgot what they were called. For your American Girl doll? Yeah. Oh. 
this. Yeah, this is such great for family bonding, being able to be with other Coasties and have this experience together. You can leave the rank at the door and just enjoy other families that yes. know what you live through and know what you work through. And uh, whether you're sharing with your immediate family or other families, it's, it's a fun opportunity for a jump out. This is so cute. As a military veteran, I know that it's um, common to be on duty 24-7. There's deployments, they're gone, you know, the service members. We don't get to see each other that often. Yeah. Like FaceTime or whatever is, is not the same. So when we are home and we have this opportunity to really have fun family time, and everything is very important. <laughs> Yeah, the only thing on the schedule is lunch at 11.30. So you, you don't want to be late for that one. Do you want beans? Yeah? On the side? On the side? One bean, one, one bean. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Ketchup, mustard. Both. Both. I'll do the chicken and the ribs. Okay. It's just, it is lovely. I like uh, just being able to talk to people and connecting. And it's a place where families can come together, sit in the shade together, and get to know each other again. Back in 1969, when the foundation started, it focused on Coast Guard Academy cadets. Now its mission is to strengthen the entire Coast Guard community, from those baby Coasties on the ponies, to retirees, to spouses, to helping with college. Isabel DeSano. She is graduating today with a Bachelor of Arts in Forensic Psychology. Isabel? Speaking on this stage is an honor and a privilege that would not be possible without the love and support of several individuals. Thank you to my mom, dad, grandma, and grandpapa. I cannot thank you enough. Each of you are the epitome of hope I hope to be one day. I love you. To the Coast Guard Foundation, whose financial contributions have made my college experience possible. Thank you for choosing me as a scholarship recipient. I would not be the person I am today without the use of Coast Guard, and I would not trade anything for the honor and privilege I learned from being a military child. Coming up, we'll fly with the Coast Guard over protected DC airspace. We'll show you a special way Coast Guard members honor their fallen heroes every year. And don't forget, dogs. Heroes of the Coast Guard is brought to you in part by our anchor sponsor, Bollinger Shipyards. Welcome back to Heroes of the Coast Guard. I'm Amy Scott, and just in case you're just joining us, you have missed so much. Good thing you'll be able to catch this full broadcast again anytime at CoastGuardFoundation.org. But speaking of Heroes of the Coast Guard, right now you're going to meet the team or teams, I should say, who protect the very important airspace over Washington, D.C. Any small plane pilots out there watching? If so, stay away from there. Air Station Atlantic City, awesome. It's definitely one of the busiest air stations uh, that's around in the Coast Guard. We cover from Connecticut down to Virginia for uh, search and rescue, um, up to about 150 to 200 miles uh, offshore. So we've got uh, 12 helicopters, uh, about 250 personnel, about 60 pilots, 180 enlisted personnel, uh, and 10 civilian contractors. We operate the facility here in Atlantic City, as well as a uh, facility down in uh, the National Capital Region Air Defense Facility. We have a lot of search and rescue cases, both in New York Harbor, along the Hudson, uh, down in DC, along the Potomac. 
Um, so it's congested airspace, it's challenging conditions with nor'easters and everything else. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, variety there as far as what we see. Uh, recently I was a part of a, a, a difficult case, uh, a nighttime case. Uh, there was uh, two mariners aboard a sailboat. They hadn't done anything wrong. This wasn't that they uh, got themselves in trouble. Their boat simply broke in bad weather conditions. It wasn't forecast. None of this was forecast to be a third of the intensity that it was. The waves were going over the boat entirely. At one point we got hit with such a big one and it actually tossed me and I felt the, the steering snap at that point. It's like inside the cabin of the boat getting like tossed back and forth because we have absolutely no steering. Oh, um, yeah. And in this time, he calls the Coast Guard. U.S. Coast Guard, do you read me? The initial call that we got is that there was a vessel that was aground and being pounded by the surf, uh, and these people were in immediate distress. Each wave, you would feel the boat get like lifted slightly and then just hit again and again. And at this point, we call the Coast Guard again and we're like, we're not moving. My position is three. Nine, As I made my nine, way to the command center, the last word I got was that they were possibly going to abandon ship. And with the weather conditions as they were, it was essentially a nor'easter or, or like a wintertime tropical storm is what it felt like. Uh, that really increased the urgency uh, for us to get out. We were airborne in 18 minutes. Yeah, yeah. they were definitely fast and I'm thankful for it. When we arrived on scene to where we believed uh, they were, um, it was very difficult to see anything. Um, thankfully, we had communications with them on the radio. Um, they explained that their situation was dire, uh, and we were able to, to quickly uh, expedite our operations and deliver the rescue swimmer. My cousin saw a video of us being airlifted, and she's like, oh my god, isn't that scary? And I'm like, actually, that's the least scary part, because the Coast Guard has gotten there, and you know that you're safe in that moment. It's a really humbling, uh, feeling to be rescuing somebody uh, from those bad conditions to, to get them back and, uh, and nothing feels better than when you get the, the high five or the handshake or sometimes a hug saying, you know, thank you, I don't know if I'd be here without you. The Rotary Wing Air Intercept Mission came to be after 9-11 when the government realized they needed to have a more protective bubble around the airspace here in, around D.C. The National Capital Region Air Defense Facility, where we are here, is a satellite unit of the air station in Atlantic City. So we technically work for them, even though here we work primarily for the Department of Defense. For all of the low, slow flying aircraft, such as a small Cessna, single engine type airframes, when they come into the restricted airspace around uh, DC, our mission is to go out and identify them and uh, try to convey any of the activities that they're doing for the decision makers to then decide how they're going to um, handle that target. We're there to let them know that they're in an area they're not supposed to be and to get them out, uh, you know, to help we uh, save them and save others that are around in the area. Anytime uh, there's a, a presidential movement, uh, any sort of national special security events, uh, you know, for example, a United Nations or a G8 summit, those sorts of things. Could be anywhere from the West Coast, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, here in uh, Delaware, the President's home state, uh, Camp David, etc. So it really can be a lot of different locations um, that we're uh, tasked with last minute uh, getting there to uh, ensure airspace um, security. Our entire mission is to try to ID someone before something bad happens, yes. I've been impressed uh, ever since I've gotten here. The things that we challenge our pilots with day in and day out, I would put up against any of the other pilots uh, throughout the Coast Guard. Um, it's just, uh, you know, like I said, tremendously busy, congested airspace, challenging search and rescue cases, um, and then throwing on the uh, presidential uh, protection mission with the RWI as well as DC, I think really just puts the icing on the cake for them. As we all know, weather can be dangerous. Floods and severe storms keep the Coast Guard men and women very busy, and hurricane season is intense. Coast Guard members are busy day and night saving people and property, and oftentimes their own families are at risk. Here's more on that with Coast Guard Foundation President Susan Ludwig. So hurricane season, let's talk about this, a very busy time for the Coast Guard, I know. So what happens when these storms hit these coastal communities? What do you guys do? When natural disasters strike, our Coast Guard members are often the first responders. 
to these events and all the while their own homes are being impacted. Mm -hmm. So what we do at the foundation is we assess the member and their family's needs through our emergency disaster relief program and we push out funding in the first three days so that they can bounce back from things like hurricanes and wildfires and floods and have the grants that they need to repair and recover from these events. Can you be a little more specific? How? Sure. Uh, our funds go to things like insurance deductibles, mm -hmm. replacing household goods that are lost, or shoring up their houses so they don't incur even more damage. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all seen the footage of the flyovers during these storms, Amy, and you've seen roofs ripped off and you've seen trees impacting cars and homes mm -hmm. and people walking through their homes in feet of water. And just imagine yourself as a Coast Guard member. So you're out there rescuing people and delivering people to higher ground while you know that your home is also being impacted. That's what the Coast Guard Foundation is doing. We are standing by these people, we are saluting their service, and we're ensuring that they know that there is help on the way. That's great. During difficult times, we're reminded of just how heroic Coast Guard members really are. Our fallen heroes, the ones who've made the ultimate sacrifice for service, are not forgotten. As a tribute to those who have fallen, the Coast Guard Foundation hosts Run to Remember events where everyone is invited to participate and to reflect on the heroes who have been lost. The Run to Remember are important for us because like, it gives us the chance to, to honor those who, who die doing what we do every day. Remember who they are, their names, and, and what they were doing when, they, when they, they gave the ultimate sacrifice. It's been 12 years since the first run to remember took place in Florida. Since then, Coast Guard cities across the country and in other countries have fallen in step with their own runs to memorialize fallen heroes. The runs have evolved into other fitness events to raise money as well, from rides to remember to workouts to remember. There was even a climb to remember. The Marine Safety Unit Texas City hosts the area run to remember here uh, in honor of two shipmates that we lost. Tonight. Senior Chief Pavini and Chief Bloom were Coast Guard Marine inspectors who were killed uh, conducting an offshore uh, inspection of a vessel when their helicopter crashed. Thank you for letting us be a part of something that my grandfather loved so incredibly much. My mom used to say that as much as he loved my grandmother, he told her that he loved to see more. I don't know if I believe that, but um, that's what he said. My husband James would be thrilled. He was very involved with remembering those who had gone before. Whenever a family member passed, he would organize a, um, a salute and take the guys down there for it. Um, it was, it was important to him to remember. So it would be, it's an honor that they're remembering him. No. This is not a solemn event, this is a remembrance event. Um, everybody thinks that when you talk about people who've passed away or, or, or passed on that it's a solemn event, but honestly, it, for me, uh, it's, it's a, it lets me know that you remember them. I think when you incorporate physical activity or exercise into events to remember people who, who we've lost is, uh, I think it's a really good combination. I think especially with running, you, you have time to reflect and think while you're on the run. And, and what better to, to think about than those people we're here to honor today. All money raised through donations and sales of these memorial t-shirts goes to the Coast Guard Foundation's Tragedy Assistance Support to help Coast Guard families who lose their Coast Guard hero. As you walk the path today, and read the names of those that are gone, remember them, and say a small prayer for all those that they left behind, for each of them is still dearly missed today. On behalf of my family and the families of each coast we remember, I want to thank you for coming out today and making a difference. Thank you for remembering those who are gone and making a difference for those who are left. Here's one of those shirts right now. Now you can get one of these of your own at CoastGuardFoundation.org. These t-shirts are generously supported by our corporate sponsor, Lidos. The Foundation's scholarship program has invested more than $6 million into the futures of our Coast Guard kids so they can earn their college degrees and go out and do good in the world. Here's a note of thanks from another very appreciative recipient. 
Hi everyone, my name is Jessie DeLava and I want to extend a sincere thank you to the Coast Guard Foundation and the Buttrick family for their generous contribution to my education. One of my main goals throughout college is to avoid taking student loans. With the help of their tremendous scholarship, I have been able to attend Clemson University this fall to study biology with the hopes of becoming either a physician's assistant or a researcher. I cannot thank you all enough for your generosity. I plan to take every opportunity the scholarship has allowed me, and I hope to make you proud. Thank you all again, and go Tigers! Coming up, we'll go to a special R&R place for families that's gotten a little TLC, courtesy of the Foundation. And there's an important new resiliency program that supports Coasties, helping Coasties. Oh, and yes, we haven't forgotten, Coast Guard dogs still to come. Thank you to our anchor sponsors, ABS, Harvey Gulf, Hornback Offshore, and City Experiences, anchored by Hornblower. We've talked a lot about how dedicated the men and women of the Coast Guard are, and we've seen how they love being in active service. But you know, sometimes stress can be a lot, whether it's job-related, home-related, or just dealing with these unsettling times we live in. Like everyone, Coasties can have bad days, too. One resource for military members struggling is the Coast Guard's Chaplain Corps. They offer all types of counsel and guidance, but in the Coast Guard's first district, they've launched a pilot program that offers additional wellness and resiliency support right inside their own units. I mean, it's critically important, N not only in any job, which is certainly the case, but especially something like the military, for people to stay mentally and psychologically healthy. I mean, this job can be quite demanding, right? I mean, right now, you know, I'm, I'm standing in a beautiful harbor and it's a nice summer day, but there are certainly those bad cases in the winter time or when people are deployed on cutters or overseas. These are high stress inducing environments. Altitude. Altitude. Yes, sir. And JT, you want to open the cabin door? Yes, sir. But you need to be mentally prepared to meet that kind of stress. And so psychological and mental health are a huge step towards a person being able to deal with the stress day over day, not only to be retained within the service, but to perform their job well, to respond to something that might have an unfortunate outcome on a search and rescue case. And the peer support program helps create a space for people to stay mentally healthy. So the idea behind the Shipmate Support Peer Program is to empower members at units to be a listening ear and an expert in referral for their shipmates in distress. So that they're, they're having a bad day, they have someone in the unit that they can go to uh, to talk with to uh, get ideas about the next level of care. So uh, th those members who uh, want to help out their, their shipmates, they um, raise their hand and get the training and they volunteer themselves to be available 24-7. The reasons that people will talk to a shipmate support peer, sometimes it's as simple as, you know, they've just had a rough day at work, or maybe they don't understand a decision from a superior or an order from a supervisor. And so sometimes it's just a matter of they need somebody else to talk to and just express some of those frustrations, bounce, bounce a perspective off of, get a little bit of an outside look at their situation. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes it is as serious as somebody that's contemplating uh, suicide or, or they're having um, you know, suicidal ideations. We train them in ASSIST, which is a suicide intervention skills tool. Uh, ASSIST teaches uh, people how to uh, listen and to hear the story and to help uh, get that person who's having suicide ideations to that next level of care. I have been able to apply ASSIST in a couple of specific instances. So I, I joined the Coast Guard to save lives and that's what attracted me to this branch specifically over all of the other branches. I love that core mission of this branch of the military. And the Shipmate Support Peer Program is another way to extend that mission, except now it's the people that we're even closer to, which is our very own shipmates. So if we can't take care of each other, then there's no way we're going to be able to take care of people out there on the water that are in distress. All of us need to be ready when it comes to our uh, physical health, mental health, and spiritual health. So uh, programs like the Shipmate Support Peer and, um, you know, and, and having groups like the CG Foundation to provide that support to empower us to do more for our individuals 
really goes a long way in helping us execute the mission we're called to do. So long deployments can be one of the biggest stressors for Coast Guard families. It's not just hard for the individual, but for the spouses and families of our Coast Guard members as well. Time spent together, not on your devices, but actually together, is very important. Now down in Florida, there's a unique, tranquil vacation spot available to Coasty families. And with thanks to the Coast Guard Foundation and the Armed Forces Family Foundation, the place got the TLC it needed to make it extra special. As Coast Guard men and women, we are away from our families a lot. Sometimes that's a couple hours, sometimes that's across the continent or across the world. So the, the times that we get to spend together, though rare, need to be special, right? So it's about quality, not quantity. This is really a, a hidden gem of Florida. It's really laid back, relaxed. It's not like if you go to Miami Beach where everything's hustle and bustle. This is a place you just come to, to chill and have a good time. When the Coast Guard members come and stay here, they have a place to unwind and enjoy themselves in a beautiful space that comes in well within a Coast Guard member's budget. There's three cottages. There's uh, the inlet cottage, which is closest to the inlet, of course, and then the beach cottage, and then the, the small one, which we call it the sundowner because it's got the best sunsets. <laughs> I mean, my family came to this very cottage 20 years ago, and it's still some of the things we talk about and remember. They remember going up in the lighthouse. They remember playing on the beach. Me and my son went out in the kayak. I mean, they're just precious memories that to have that ability to build that, you know, while you're on duty, serving your country, um, it's just really special. And so for our donors to be able to support this through the Coast Guard Foundation, to work with the Coast Guard Morale and Recreation Program, it's just a great partnership and it benefits Coast Guard members and the nation. The Hillsborough cottages were built around 1900 to house the Hillsborough Lighthouse Keepers. After the full automation of the lighthouse happened in the 40s, the cottages were given over to the Coast Guard's Morale, Wellness and Recreation Department, who made them available for our military members and their families. They've been maintained over the years, but at a minimal level, so there's a lot of work that can be done to an old building. We've painted everything and then that kind of opened up the next thing, which was, okay, we need bathrooms, we need closets, we need doors, we need walls, we need everything. But the Coast Guard Foundation funds allow us to go that step above. cottages up there give us this really amazing special place to share time together and have lifelong memories and pictures and um, being able to reconnect after you know most of the year is spent over social media and, and phone calls you get to have an amazing experience with your family. So we've had generations that come in for 30-35 years and I'm just encouraged to get the next generation. I got a new family coming in tomorrow, first time here. You know, husband, wife, and two little ones, so that's going to be the beginning of their 35 years here, so I'm thrilled about that. Another way the Coast Guard Foundation really makes a difference for our Coast Guard servicemen and women is by honoring them at events around the country. These are exciting and very patriotic occasions. Service members of all ranks, along with all of those who support the Coast Guard Foundation, are in attendance. Super fancy, super fun, and well, they look something like this. Every year, in locations all across the country, the Coast Guard Foundation invites industry leaders, civilian supporters, retired and active duty military to come together to pay tribute to the brave men and women who serve in the United States Coast Guard. These events are important for a lot of reasons. Um, first and foremost, it gives the local area 
a chance to meet the Coast Guard who they may or may not interface with, but understands the Coast Guard to a certain degree, but gets to understand them a lot more. It's, it's nice to meet everybody. You know, I guess to see all the people supporting the Coast Guard. Just a nice to get all the perspectives about what we do and kind of explain how we do it. And their commitment tends to increase and grow the more they understand the Coast Guard. So I work for the Seafarers House and we have a lot of support of the Coast Guard and any activity that we can do for or support, we support each other so it's important to us. Prior military myself, I spent 21 years in and this is my second career. And uh, I, I can't do enough for the military because people like this couldn't do enough for me when I was deployed. You know, whatever comes around goes around. It, it, it's my time to give. I'm just excited to be here. You can sense by the energy, the atmosphere, how electric it is. It should be a great night. Despite being faced with incredible adversity, each of the crews being recognized this evening came together with a bias for action while putting service before self. These dinners are a way of recognizing these enlisted people that work really hard to do great things, and it gives them almost a affirmative uh, uh, sense of why I joined the Coast Guard. Being recognized at a dinner like this kind of strengthens their commitment to the Coast Guard. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, thanks to Tom and, and the amazing folks at the Coast Guard Foundation. Thank you so much uh, to all the sponsors here for the Coast Guard Foundation event. It's, you know, the Coast Guard Foundation does so much for us. That's the workforce that your uh, work and generosity helps to support. Again, thank you. Thank you for all that you do to help support our, our men and women in uniform. Semper Paratus. <laughs> Another good thing about being a Coast Guard member, you never have to stress about what to wear to a formal event like that, right? Now here's another young and very appreciative Coast Guard family member who is a Foundation Scholarship Awardee. Thank you. I'm absolutely honored to be the recipient of the 2022 Coast Guard Foundation Scholarship. I'd like to extend my gratitude for this generous contribution to my educational success. Um, so I've been accepted into East Carolina University and I'm currently attending it now. Um, I'm majoring in both security studies and political science. I'm pursuing this to uh, better ensure our national security. Uh, this scholarship will help me financially as I undertake uh, the balance of, of, of this heavy course load and not having to have a job while in school. So I just want to say thank you one more time and, and I, I really, I'm really am appreciative to the Coast Guard Scholarship Foundation. We're nearing the end of our program, but we didn't forget, stick around, because coming up, we're gonna let the Coast Guard service dogs out. Thank you to our anchor sponsors, L3 Harris Technologies, Lidos, Auto Candies, LLC, and HII. Welcome back to Heroes of the Coast Guard. Did you know that dogs are essential to many Coast Guard missions? They work hard. And morale dogs provide companionship for Coast Guard members who are standing the watch. And if you're a fan of dogs, like I'm a fan of dogs, you are going to be very entertained right now. Look at these faces. These are some happy dogs. You know why? Because they're Coast Guard dogs. Some are here for morale, companionship, and all-around fun with their Coasties, and then there are some that are professionally trained to do the tough work, and they do it well. I mean, not just any dog would go along with this, let alone just wearing all this gear. Coast Guard dogs are a part of Coast Guard life as much as they're a part of everyday life for you and me. First, they're essential to many Coast Guard missions. They go on deployments, aid in rescues, search in tight places, and sniff out bombs. And all they ask for in return, a decent meal and a lot of love. This is K-9 Simba. But don't think for a minute that just any dog can be in the K-9 unit. A lot of rigorous training that uh, they go through. 
These are all canine training school graduates from Joint Base San Antonio Lackland in Texas. That's where they train and meet their partners, maritime enforcement specialists who become their best friends. Every day we go to work together, we go home together, we go to the park and play together. <laughs> I take him everywhere. I'm with him more than anybody else. <laughs> the canine units work in coordination with local, state, and federal partners, and they can be spotted at all the major events. We just came back from the Kentucky Derby. Other canine handlers in the past have gone to uh, World Series, Super Bowls, major national events, Democratic National Conventions, Republican National Conventions, inaugurations all sorts of major events like that. These two morale dogs, Thor and Loki, from Station Marquette in Michigan, are even social media stars, appearing regularly on Facebook safe boating posts. Yeah, they look like they know what they're talking about. Coast Guard dogs are special animals. They're brave, loving, and heroic. I guess the only issue I can say they really have is when it comes to swimming, maybe learning more than that one stroke? The Coast Guard Foundation is working with the service to build a memorial at Base Alameda to honor Coast Guard service dogs. The effort was led by Coast Guard Foundation Director Fred Brodsky and many more donors who love dogs answered the call to ensure we create a lasting legacy for the Coast Guard's most faithful companions. So thank you to the United States Coast Guard and thank you for watching. And before we go, here's a little more with Coast Guard Foundation President Susan Ludwig. Susan, what fuels your work? Amy, of all the things that we do and all the support we give to the Coast Guard members, it's all fueled by our Coast Guard Foundation supporters. They give each and every day to our Coast Guard mission, and they believe in our vision where we see a world where each and every Coast Guard member has the resources they need to succeed throughout their lives. And is there anything else you'd like to say? Thank you, Amy, for this opportunity. I would just like to say thank you. Thank you to the entire Coast Guard Foundation community, our supporters, our Coast Guard members, and their families. Thank you for showing up for the United States Coast Guard and for our nation.